everyone knows the values that flag represents. It stands for freedom and free speech and habeas corpus and the rule of law. And above all, it stands for democracy. Britain is admired and even loved around the world for our inventiveness, for our humor, for our universities, our scientists, our armed forces, our diplomacy. Thank you, Conference. You know, for me, taking on this job as Foreign Secretary and our mission for a global Britain is the fulfilment of a long-standing dream. Fifteen years ago, I was a young Foreign Office lawyer. I was posted out to The Hague. And, you know, I used to have diplomats from Asia to South America. They'd come up to me and they'd say, you guys in the EU spend so much time talking to yourselves. You miss so much of what's going on in the rest of the world. You know, it was true then and it's true today. Brussels isn't the only game in town. Everywhere I go as Foreign Secretary, people are fired up by our vision for a global Britain. When I visited the US, President Trump invited me into the Oval Office to tell me just how much he loves our country and how much he admires our Prime Minister. When I visited Bangkok for the ASEAN meeting, of Asia-Pacific nations, they embraced our role in their region because they prize our commitment to the rules-based international system. In Mexico, we talked about climate change. In Canada, we talked about our joint campaign to protect journalists around the world from torture and arbitrary detention. Truth is, we Brits get a very warm welcome almost everywhere in the world. Okay, maybe not in Luxembourg. But you know what? I think the British people have had more than enough of EU leaders disrespecting British Prime Ministers. So we'll strive in good faith for a good deal. But if the EU spurn the opportunity for a win-win deal, we will leave at the end of October. No ifs, no buts. Now, I hope we can stay good European neighbours and friends, but we'll be free to chart our own course as masters of our own destiny at home and abroad, with a much more liberal and energetic approach to free trade, as Liz, Liz Truss has just been talking about. But our vision of global Britain also reaches well beyond trade. And when I was posted to The Hague back in 2003, I headed up the Foreign Office's war crimes team. And I could tell you experiences like that Stay with you. I visited Sierra Leone and I met the victims of that terrible conflict. And I came across this one boy who told me how a rebel soldier had asked whether he wanted a long or a short sleeve before deciding where to wield his machete on his arm. That was a really heartbreaking story to listen to. But you know what? I'm proud that Britain helped Sierra Leone get back on its feet. I'm proud to have been part of the UK's international effort to bring the perpetrators of those crimes to justice. So as we look to our future, I think our foreign policy should be guided by a clear moral compass. We've got to offer the poorest countries the chance to trade with us, freed from the shackles of hypocritical EU protectionism. We've got a lead when it comes to tackling climate change. That's why we're hosting COP26, which is the global conference for, on climate change, over in Glasgow next year. And we've got to offer the downtrodden around the world the hope that comes with standing up for the basic freedoms that we cherish here in Manchester, this week, in this very conference centre. You know, I think sometimes it feels like a hopeless task. 
But history remembers the courage of those who stand up to be counted. You know, back in the 1990s, I met a Russian dissident called Natan Sharansky. He'd been locked in a Soviet gulag for nine years because he was campaigning for the rights of oppressed Jews to leave Russia. Now, I, I still find it almost impossible to imagine. I mean, just think about it for a moment. Nine years in a Soviet jail. Think about those miserable conditions, being separated from your loved ones. I asked Sharansky what kept his hopes alive during all that long time, locked up alone. And he told me that the political prisoners had a secret way of communicating in the gulag. They tapped on the walls in code to spread the word. So when, in 1983, Ronald Reagan stood up and called out the Soviet Union as an evil empire, those prisoners came alive with a hum of jailed dissidents tapping and whispering from cell to cell. And Reagan's courage and moral clarity gave hope to those who feared they'd been forgotten. And Sharansky was the first political prisoner released by Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, I know the world is a very different place today. But we must never forget the lessons of history. And we must keep the flame of freedom alive in the darkest corner of the bleakest jails. For those struggling for the basic liberties we take for granted, the rights you jealously guard here this week to debate, to have your say, to hold your politicians to account. So we won't look the other way when the people of Hong Kong are beaten on commuter trains for exercising their right to peaceful protest. We won't stand idly by whilst journalists are jailed or tortured or beaten up for criticizing the despotic regime of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. And conference, we will never rest until all those bearing UK nationality, detained on a cruel whim in Iran, are free to rejoin their loved ones at home. No, that's not our way. We'll, we'll relish, not shrink, from our duty to take a leading role in bringing the perpetrators of the worst injustices to account. Whether it's ensuring the release of the two Reuters journalists jailed in Myanmar just for reporting on the plight of the Rohingya refugees, or bringing war criminals to justice from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And when we leave the EU, we're going to be able to do even more. So conference... I can tell you today that when we leave the EU, we're going to bring into force a UK Magnitsky law to put visa bans and asset freezes on those individuals deemed responsible for serious human rights abuses like torture. Because the British people don't want those with blood on their hands doing their Christmas shopping down in Knightsbridge. They don't want their dirty money laundered through British banks. And because our vision of a truly global Britain means being a force for good in the world, a good global citizen. And you know, conference, when I think about some of the challenges we face in the world and how hard some of those people have, a, have it abroad, and I think of the fate of those living under oppression, it reminds me just how how lucky we are, just how much we prize our hard-earned prosperity and our hard-won freedoms here in this country. And we must never take those for granted. And that's what's at stake if Labour takes office under Jeremy Corbyn. The Labour Party, once a mainstream party, now hails the failed socialist experiment in Venezuela, where the population starves and dissidents are shot in the street a party that chooses to believe the Kremlin over its own intelligence agencies when Putin's assassins poison people on the streets of Salisbury. And a party led by a man in Jeremy Corbyn who attends a memorial at the graves of terrorists responsible for butchering Israeli Olympic athletes out of anti-Semitic hate. I say this, and I, I say it to all of you, you know I'm a passionate Brexiteer. There are some things even bigger than Brexit. And keeping that lot out of Downing Street is one of them. So 
So to any of our colleagues or former colleagues who may just be tempted to put Jeremy Corbyn and that momentum mob into number 10 as part of some kind of temporary anti-Brexit coalition, I just say this. History would never forgive you. And as for the Liberal Democrats, they want to scrap the result of the 2016 vote. You can't call yourself a Democrat, put it in the name of your party, and then try to cancel a referendum. No one ever accused the Lib Dems of consistency. <laughs> but when it comes to offences under the trade, the trade Description Act, they are guilty as charged. <laughs> this Prime Minister's got a better way to take us forward. Let's get Brexit done. Let's move on. Let's unite behind that one nation vision for our country. And let's bring the Conservative family back together. You know, we in the Conservatives, we keep our promises. So we're going to make a success of Brexit. We're going to free our country to reach its full potential. And with this Prime Minister's leadership, with his energy, we're going to seize the historic opportunity for, Brexit, for Britain to reach out to the world on our own terms, with global horizons, limitless ambition, and a strong moral compass. My friends, it's time to put the past behind us. It's time to let go of the wrangling and the doubts. It's time for us to be the country we want to be. Great Britain. Ambitious, confident and free. Thank you all very much. Thank you.